chapter number 7, Luke chapter 7, <clears throat> we've been going through a study on what it means to be a disciple, what is a disciple, a disciple is so much more than just what most people would think as a believer, really a disciple is someone that is dedicated and committed to serving and following the Lord. And I think that term serving is, is thrown around a lot without us actually like thinking, meditating on what it means to, to serve somebody, to be a servant. I mean, that's where the word comes from. Um, and it means then basically that we are at the beck and call of the Lord. If he asks, then the answer is, here am I, Lord, serve me. And that's the essence of a disciple. Yes, it's we continue in his word. Why? Because we're waiting to hear what he says, what he's asking of us. We, we want to do what he's asking. We're in, you know, joyful anticipation of what he's going to ask of us. And we're, we're readily looking to do what he's asking next. And if, if Jesus himself walked in the doors right now, any of us would be willing to do anything he asked. I mean, we'd, be, we'd jump at the opportunity to do it. Well, he's already done that. He already has come and told us what he expects of us, what he wants of us, and it's all right here. He, he's told us, so are we joyfully anticipating what we get to do for him next? Um, that's what it means to be a disciple, and we're looking at that. We're looking um, not an exhaustive study where we look at every single thing the Bible says about it, but a pretty in-depth study on what it means to be a disciple and you know I just started in the New Testament and we've we've gotten to Luke so far where it speaks of being a disciple I haven't even hit every time it's brought up I just am picking you know verses that I think hit a good point and and teaching on that <clears throat> so as we continue with this we see that disciples are willingly sent on missions <clears throat> remember they're they're dedicated they're committed servants so a disciple is going to be somebody that is willingly sent on a mission. So do you willingly do the things that, that, that the Lord asks you? The, the th simple things in the Bible, do you willingly do those or do you fight Him over them? Do you argue with Him over doing them? That's a real good question that we each need to ask ourselves. Am I willingly doing the things that He's asking me or am I, I fighting Him? And by fighting him, it might be giving into your flesh. So you might be able to stand here and say, I'm not fighting the Lord. I want to do what the Lord wants. Yes, but you're giving into your flesh. So you're fighting the Lord because the, 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 the spirit and the flesh are battling one another. OK, so when we give into the flesh, we're, we're fighting the Lord. We're not giving in to that. We're saying no to the to the spirit, to what God wants. And we're saying yes to what we want. So. <clears throat> Are you willingly doing the things that God asks or are you fighting against the Lord? Because disciples are willingly sent on mission. So we're in Luke chapter 7 and verse 19. Luke 7, 19. It says here, speaking of John the Baptist, And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? <coughs> Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? So John called two of his disciples, and what did he do? He sent them to Jesus, and that's exactly what they did. They went to him. When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? So what did these disciples do? I know they're not Jesus' disciples. I get that. But we're still learning what God says about a disciple. So what did these disciples do? When they were sent, what did they do? They went, right? It's obvious, right? They went. So disciples are willingly sent on missions, on whatever task it may be that, that, that our Lord wants, that the one we serve wants. That's what they're willing to do. <clears throat> Let's also look at, at Luke 10, 1, Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. Luke 10, 1, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. So he 
appoints 70 other also besides the 12. He appoints these 70 and he sends them out two by two. Okay, so what happens then? Disciples are willingly sent. They wanted to go. They were there. They were available. The Lord said, I have a task for you. I want you to go out, share the good news with people, tell them, here's your mission. And they went out and did it. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. He sends them out because there's a harvest that is great and there's few laborers. Imagine if, if all your living came from harvesting a field. And like I'm no farmer, but I do know if you don't get the crop in by a certain time, it's going to go bad. So you only have a certain period of time that you can bring that crop in, especially in places where it really rains. If you don't get it in before the rain comes in, it'll destroy your crop. And then you're basically going to have no money for the year and you may have no food for the year. I mean, it's going to be bad, bad stuff. So when you grow up in, a, in an economy like that, you understand how important this is, that the harvest is, is plenty, is great, but the laborers are few. And he's talking about human souls, people that need to hear the gospel, that need to hear the good news of what Jesus Christ did. He says, there's a great need. And he has already commissioned and sent us. Okay, that, that commission was given. Where at? Somebody help me. Where was that commission given to us? There's a few places. Anybody know one of them in the Bible? Matthew. Did you say it? I thought I saw you mouthing it. What'd you say? Okay. Anybody say the chapter and verses? Huh? There we go. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. I'll help you out with the last part. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's the Great Commission is given to His church. That's We've already been commissioned to do this. He's already told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why? Because the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. There's few laborers. So this is a task that He's given to us. This is why we regularly go share the gospel. This is why on Saturday morning we're going to be meeting here at 10.30 to go share the gospel with others because of that commission, because we've been giving that. This is why we, we seek to, to, to talk about the Lord with people we run into, with, with, with family, with friends, with co-workers, with, with strangers we meet at the grocery store. This is why we do these things, because of this commission, this great commission, because there's a great harvest and God loves people. God wants people saved. God died for people. He died for souls. And He's left us with the task of introducing them to Him, of showing them their need for Him. He's left that task to you. To you. That is on your shoulders. He left that task on your shoulders. <clears throat> very important. You're very important to the Lord. <clears throat> Next, if we would go to Luke chapter 8, verse 22. Luke chapter 8 and verse 22. This is an important part of understanding what it means to be a disciple. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I think there's a misconception here with, with, with people and coming into Christianity. People think, well, I get saved, everything's going to be good. I start following the Lord, I start serving the Lord, everything's going to be great, my life's going to be good. Why would anything bad happen to me? I'm doing what God asks me to do, right? Okay, that, that sounds good, but that's not reality. Because sometimes the Lord is going to take you through a storm. Sometimes the Lord's going to be the one to put you through something. Okay, because the Lord wants to get you to a place maybe where in 10 years from now, you're going to be able to help somebody else. Or I don't always know the reason why, but just for you to grow, the Lord will bring you through some things. So we need to understand this. Disciples will be brought into difficult situations where, where they will be forced to trust the Lord so they can grow in their faith. So God will bring you as a disciple into a difficult situation where you're going to be forced to trust the Lord. Have you ever already been in a situation where it caused you to pray more than you normally do. Because some, you know, catastrophe, I don't know what it was, something bad was, was on the horizon for you. Some, some trial, some difficult situation was in front of you, and it forced you to pray more. Anybody ever been there? I've been there lots of times. Yeah, I mean, 
okay, what is God doing? He's bringing something in front of us to drive us to Him. To drive us to Him. So we will be dependent on Him. So we will trust Him. So we will learn that in this difficult situation, we can trust Him. The sad thing is that a lot of people in those difficult situations will turn from the Lord and leave. And that's the exact opposite of what God wants. He wants to draw us closer to Him. He wants to help us to grow in our faith. So Luke 8, <clears throat> verse 22, the Bible says, Now it came to pass on a certain day that He went into a ship with His disciples, and He said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. All right, what's happening here? Jesus goes into a ship, and His disciples go in with Him. And whose idea is it to go to the other side? It's His. So this is the Lord's idea, right? The Lord says, hey, because these guys are following Him. He knows they're following Him everywhere He goes. So they're already following Him. So He says, hey, let's get in this ship. We're going to go to the other side. It's His idea, right? So He is taking them in this ship to the other side. It's His idea, right? Everyone with me so far? Okay, I just want us to see what's going on. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. So now he's not, he doesn't know what's going on, right? He's asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. Now this is a bad storm. I've heard that on the, the Sea of Galilee, storms can come like that, like just out of nowhere. Um, even still to this day, like that can happen. Just a, a quick storm can come in really, really quick. And it says that this storm gets so bad that the boat, the ship is filled with water. That's a pretty bad storm. I mean, that's some waves are crashing if that thing is filled with water. And it says, and they were in jeopardy. So this is pretty serious what's happening here. And, and what's the Lord doing? He's sleeping, right? And whose idea was this? It was his idea, right? You ever thought that? Because it's, it's okay to think these things because we've all probably thought them at times like, Lord, why did you bring me through this? Why did you have this happen? Why did this happen? Why am I going through this? Why me? Why my family? Why? You think they thought some things like that? I don't know. It does. The Bible doesn't say, but... Them being human just like us, I'm sure they did. When you've gone through situations like that, have you thought things like that? Like, why am I going through this, Lord? Why is this happening to me? I've been doing everything right. Look, Lord, we're following you. We've left everything to follow you. Why is this happening to us? We're going to lose our life now, and you're sleeping. Where are you? Essentially, that's the pictures. Where are you, God? Like, why aren't you here? Where are you at? Like, you're not here in the situation. That's what's happening. That's what's going on with them. So they were in jeopardy, and they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Now, what does that word master mean? Yeah, Lord, but what does it mean to the person saying it? Why would you say, why would you call someone master? Because you're a servant, right? Because they're in charge, right? Okay, that, that's what's going on here. They say this, Master, Master, we perish. Then he arose, and what does he do? He rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. The wind and the raging of the water ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? Where is your faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and water, and they obey him. Wow, they're blown away. What type of guy is this? Who can do that? Now, it's an important statement in verse 25 when it says, And they were afraid, and they, being afraid, wondered. Because four of them were professional fishermen that grew up on the water. And it says, they were afraid. Now that tells you how serious this storm was. That they did this for a living. They grew up on the water their whole life, probably from the time they were kids. If you're wondering who the four were, it's Peter, James, John, and Andrew. Okay? Those were the four. And they were afraid. And Jesus, when all of this is happening, it didn't take him by surprise. 
He knew what was going to happen when he said, let's go to the other side. He's God. Nothing surprises him. He knew what was going on. They wake him up. He knows exactly what's happening. He arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And then I imagine it's just like, could you imagine a storm just raging on, just <laughs> waves crashing? I mean, thunder, lightning, all that, the rain coming down, everything that's going on. I don't know exactly what's happening, but just a loud storm. And then all of a sudden, Jesus rebukes the wind. He says, cease, and it just stops, and it's just complete calm. And now could you kind of picture it's like that awkward silence now with Jesus and all of them. They're all, you know, just freaked out. And then the first thing he says to them, where is your faith? Where is your faith? Is the Lord telling us that? Is the Lord telling you that? Where is your faith? Don't you trust me to take care of you? Don't you trust me to get you through the storm? Where is your faith? See, Jesus took them through that on purpose so he could help to grow their faith. So he could help to grow their dependence upon God. That they should have looked, looked to the Lord and, and asked him, God, stop this. And I know technically they did go to him. But obviously they had a lack of faith because he asked the question, where is your faith? So the Lord will bring us through storms in order to grow our faith. That's what happens to disciples. The life of a disciple is not going to be an easy life. Okay, if you are going to serve God and you're going to be dedicated and committed to him, there's times it's, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be smooth sailing and other times where it's going to be a storm that you're going through. It is not always going to be easy. Okay, we have the testimony of Scripture. When you look at, even go to the Old Testament, people that followed him, sometimes it cost them their life. Okay, every one of the apostles, history tells us, was martyred for the faith. Every single one of them gave their life for the faith. We have a, a one history book. This is just one history book on thousands that gave their life to follow Jesus. Things don't always go good when you follow the Lord. But we have to recognize that we are not building for a life here on earth. These people are going to have a better resurrection because of their testimony, because of what they did, because they have their eyes on what really matters. They have an eternal perspective, and that's how we have to see things. That's how we have to look at them. Because it's, Ten out of ten people die. We're all going to die one day. And this is why it's so important that, that each of us knows that Jesus Christ is our Savior. That each of us has come to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior to forgive our sins. To forgive your sins. To forgive your sins. To forgive my sins. This is why we need Jesus Christ. This is why He came. Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole reason Jesus came was to seek you and to seek me. That's why He came. To save us. To pay a debt He did not owe so that we could have the forgiveness of sins. So that we could have His righteousness, His God's forgiveness. So that we could be accepted in God's eyes now because of what Jesus Christ did on our behalf, on your behalf. He paid the penalty that you deserve to pay. You say, I don't understand that. Why do I deserve to pay a penalty for my sin? Because you have broken God's laws. You're a lawbreaker. I like to look at it like this. If you've ever told one lie, one lie, you're a liar. Okay, now I know without even asking you, I know that every single person, I don't even need to meet a person. I can run into any stranger on the street and I know they're a liar. I know it. The Bible says, let God be true, but every man a liar. Every man a liar. So if you've ever told one lie, turn with me. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. 
Revelation chapter 20. Now be honest with yourself and, and, and answer this question in your head. Have I ever told a lie? Well, yes, I have. All right, now think about how many lies have you told in your life? How many? How many lies do you think you've told in your life? For me, I've lost count. I, I hate even saying that. That's, that's just shameful. I don't even have a clue how many lies I've told in my life. I couldn't even throw out a close guesstimate about how many lies I've told in my life. That's how sad that is. But I really, I don't have a clue. <clears throat> it's actually Revelation 21, I'm sorry. Revelation 21. So you've already determined, yes, I, I've, I've told a lie, therefore I'm a liar. And you've probably told more than one lie. Let's just say in your life you've only told 20 lies. Okay, I'm sure it's way more than that. But let's just say you've told 20 lies in your life. Okay, let's see what the Bible says about that. Revelation 21 and verse 8, the Bible says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters. Now, that's a pretty bad list of sins, right? I mean, that's some bad sinners right there, isn't it? The fearful, the unbelieving, the atheists, the abominable, those that do the worst of the worst, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, those in, within, involved in witchcraft, idolaters. That's a bad list of sins, but look at this next part. And all, what? Liars. And all liars. Now, is that you? Is that you? You're a liar, aren't you? More than once, aren't you? And all liars, look at this, and all liars. What happens to liars? They shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. God says, if you've ever told a lie, you're going to go to the lake of fire. You're going to hell. That's what you deserve. Why? Because you're a lawbreaker. Because you broke my laws. And God is holy. And without sin, he's righteous. Let me ask you this. Who in here wants to go to heaven? Like, that's a no-brainer, man. I want to go to heaven when I die. I want to go to heaven. Now, let me ask you. If sin was in heaven, would that be heaven? If sin was in heaven, would that be heaven? No. That would be pretty much what we have here, wouldn't it? How many of you lock your doors at night? Man, I do. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm locking my, I check them every night too. I walk the house and check all the doors every night. Why do you do that? Because we live around a bunch of sinners, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound like heaven to me. That doesn't sound like anything I want. So if sin was allowed in heaven, it wouldn't be heaven. So God says there's going to be no sin there. No sin's going to be allowed there. Because God's holy and righteous. He says, i got to do away with all sin. And he says, here's what's going to happen with all sin. I'm going to throw all sin in hell in the lake of fire. You say, but wait, I'm already guilty. I've already sinned. So then what hope do I have? What hope do I have? That's where Jesus Christ stepped in. He was our substitute. When Jesus showed up on the scene, John the Baptist, who came to prepare the way for him, told everybody, look, there's Jesus. He said, behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. He takes them away. He washes them away. Jesus lived a sinless life, that perfect life that we're attaining for. He lived it. He never broke any of the Ten Commandments. He never told a lie. He never stole anything. He never blasphemed. He was never an idolater. He was never covetous. None of those things. He was never disobedient to his parents. None of that stuff that we are, he never was. He met the demands of God's law so that he could pay the penalty that we owe. He paid our sin debt. That's why he died on the cross, because he was that Lamb of God and if, if you understand the, the Old Testament sacrificial system, they would sacrifice animals as, as an atonement, as an appeasement 
to God until Jesus Christ came. Those lambs that were sacrificed, they had to get one without blemish that was as perfect as they could find because it pictured what Jesus was going to do. It's perfect, sinless. He came. He shed His blood. He died in our place as a substitute. So He took my sins when He died on the cross. If you've ever read the story in the Gospels where, where Jesus dies on the cross, He cries out, it is finished. It is finished. He took care of it. At one point on the cross, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That word forsake means to turn your back on. God the Father turned his back on God the Son when he was on the cross. Why? Why would God turn his back on his Son? Because he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's why. He took all of our sin and it was placed on Him on that cross. And what He wants to do, because He did that and He rose from the dead proving that He was God, He paid our sin debt. And what He wants to do is He wants to give us a gift. The Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, right here as it stands, I deserve, me, right here, the pastor of this church, if I get what I deserve, I deserve to go to hell because I've sinned against God. But I'm not going there. I'm not going to go to hell. And it's not because I'm good. It's not because I'm a pastor. It's not because I know the Bible. It's not because I preach the Word of God. It's not because I tell people about Jesus. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's because I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. God says, I'm offering you a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God says, here's the gift. Do you want it? And I came to Him one day as a beggar without anything I could do. I just said, yes, God, please forgive me. Give me that gift. I will receive it. I will receive the salvation that you're offering. And I asked him for that gift. I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. And the Bible says, but as many as received him, Jesus Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. At the moment that I received Jesus Christ as my Savior, I was adopted into the family of God. I became a child of God at that moment. And God gave me the gift of eternal life, meaning I cannot lose it. I have it forever. All thank You could say amen right there. Somebody help me. Say amen right there. All right, thank you. I've amened myself before because no one else did. I went and sat down and amened myself. Become a child of God. And I thank God for that day. I still remember that day. And I thank God for it. Have you had that day? Have you experienced that day when you asked God for that gift? And you received that gift, the forgiveness of sins. It's waiting. It's right there for you. It's waiting right there for you. It's a gift. There's nothing you can do for it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. You say, well, I'm going to start coming to church then so I can have that gift. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Let me illustrate it for you. Oh, man, I got something better here. All right. I got a sucker. Okay. I got a sucker, and I'm going to give this sucker away, all right? Does anybody have a dollar bill? If you got a dollar bill, pull a dollar bill out. Somebody have a dollar bill? Anybody? Anybody? Everyone's like, hold on, this sounds like a sucker's deal to me. Anybody? Oh, Isaiah's got a dollar. All right, I'm going to give you this sucker for a dollar. All right. Cool. Now, I got the dollar, and I'm going to give him this. Was that a gift? Why not? He bought it. But I said it's a gift. Does he get it if I don't get this, though? No. He has to give me this in order to get this, right? But I said, this is a gift. I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it to somebody. All right, Isaiah, I'm going to give you this sucker. But you've got to come to church for a month straight. Is that a gift? Why? He's got to do something. If he doesn't come to church, does he get this? No, so he's got to do something. Is is it a gift then? No, what's a gift? 
Right, it's just, it's just someone offers it, right? Right, okay, so here, Isaiah, I'm going to give you this gift of a sucker. You've got to give me a penny. Now, come on, you can go find a penny on the floor, right? How many of you walk past pennies on the floor? Yeah? Okay, right? You could find them. I usually pick them up too, but you could find a penny on the floor, right? So if I say, I'm going to give this to you for a penny, is that a gift? No, why not? What if he found the penny? Is it a gift? Why? He's still giving me something for it, right? If he doesn't give me the penny, he doesn't get this. All right, Isaiah, I'm going to give you this sucker. Is that a gift? Yeah, that's a gift. He didn't have to do anything for it other than what? Receive it, right? Get it. Receive it. Now, that's what you can do with the gift. Okay, the Bible says, again, keep this in mind, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus Christ already did everything. He paid for it. Because I paid for this. I already paid for it, and I'm giving it. Okay, so it's already paid for. Jesus Christ already paid for all of our sins. He paid for our forgiveness. He paid for us to have eternal life. All we have to do is receive it. He's offering it. He's offering it to each and every one of us, to you, 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 to me. He's offering it to every single one of us. And all we have to do is receive it. But here's the thing with the gift. And it's so important that we get this. This is what anybody and everybody can do with the gift. You've got two options. One, you can receive it like Isaiah did. Or two, what else can you do? Reject it. You can refuse it. You can say, I don't want that gift. I don't want it. Now, most of us would think if someone showed up for your birthday or Christmas and offered you a gift and you refused it, they'd say, that's pretty rude, wouldn't they? And most of us aren't going to do that. Oh, but people do it all the time with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's there knocking on their heart. He's convicting them. He's saying, I love you. I died for you. I'm offering this gift to you. And they're like, yeah, I see. I, I need it. But they're like, no, I'm, I don't want it. I'm a, they, they refuse it. They push him away. They push him away. I did that so many times going to church. I'd feel convicted. When, so, when a preacher was talking about this, just like I am, I'd feel so convicted in here. It would just like cut inside me. It would hurt. And I would just be like, no. Nope. They'd give the invitation at the end of church, and I remember I'd be standing there, I'd be like, I'm not going down. I was too proud. I was like, I'm too embarrassed. I didn't, what were people going to think if I go forward or whatever it was? I just didn't want to do it. And I fought it, and I pushed it away, and I pushed it away. Thank God he didn't keep, he didn't stop from coming after me. Thank God he didn't stop coming after me because he loves me. But I rejected that gift at first. I pushed it away, and I pushed it away, and I pushed it away until one day he broke me. I broke. That's repentance. Repentance. So you can't get saved if you won't repent. I tell you nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's what Jesus said. See, you have to turn to the person offering you the gift. That's repentance. If, Jesus, if Isaiah walked away from me right now as I'm offering this to him, he'll never get this unless he turns around, right? And that's what so many people are doing. They're like, nope, I'm not going to do that. I don't want it. And they turn their back and they walk away from God. But if they ever want the gift that he's offering, they've got to turn around. They have to repent and then receive it. Repent and believe the gospel. I did that so many years ago. I remember kneeling down. It was not far from here. It was just down the street from here, the house I was at. Man, I could take you right there to it right now. The people living there would probably think it's weird if we were all standing there staring in the window. But, but I could take you there right now. And I remember kneeling down and asking God to save me. I remember praying. I prayed like, I don't know, three, four, five, six times because I wasn't sure if I did it right. I was like, Lord, please just save me. I don't want to go to hell. Lord, forgive me, please. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And I just kept praying that same type of thing over and over because I wasn't sure I did it right. But man, from that day, he changed my life. I became a child of God. He forgave me because I received the gift that he was offering. Have you received the gift that God is offering? He loves you. He died for you to prove his love for you. And the gift is there. Salvation's waiting for you. 
if you'll receive it. If you'll receive it. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the word of God. Help us to be those faithful disciples that follow you, Lord, that, that our faith in you grows, Lord, from the moment we get saved all the way through, we keep growing in our trust for you. Lord, help each of us as, as we journey with you and, and follow you as disciples, Lord, that our faith would grow, that our trust and dependence in you would grow more and more, that we would be faithful followers, servants to do your bidding, even when it's difficult, Lord. I pray especially for those, if there's any here that don't know you as their Savior, that, Lord, they would receive you today. They would not reject you, but they'd receive that free gift of eternal life. They would cry out to you, asking for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, as I'm done praying and we have an invitation when the music starts, the piano starts, I pray that, Lord, anyone interested in knowing if their sins are forgiven or not. If they have questions, they just come up and, and sit on the front row and, and I'll sit down and talk with them, show them how they can know their sins are forgiven. Lord, please just don't let them put it off. Don't let them be so foolish as I was to keep saying no. Lord, convict them, break them, so that they will ask you to be their Savior. Please, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now this time